Hello, good morning and welcome to NewsX. We're live on DSTV Channel 4 to 1, Go TV Channel 1 to 5, across all our social media handles. We're joining you on TV. Coming up within the next 60 minutes, municipal assemblies in Accra vow to slash air pollution emission by 30% by 2030. End of the process of the Breathe Accra, we would have been able to reduce the pollution levels by a good 30 or so percent. But how do they plan to achieve that? Stay with us because we'll be engaging the Accra Metropolitan Assembly this morning on the show. Also coming up, residents of Jairi in the Wa East District of the Upper West Region demand government fix deplorable roads in the area. We'll hear from them. And later today, it's Black Stars versus Palankras Neglas of Nangola in the World Cup qualifier. Please, we will be engaging all the experts as we look at our chances ahead of the match. My name is Fosina Savo. Take a seat and be my guest. For choosing us for your home of independent, fearless, and credible journalism, the municipal assemblies in Accra have taken a bold step to slash air pollution emissions by 30% by 2030 as the city embraces the Breathe Cities initiative. Checks reveal air pollution claims more than 28,000 lives annually in Ghana. Beach reporter Michael Ashali has more from a stakeholders' event that unveiled plans to deploy a network of sensors to vigilantly monitor pollution hotspots. In 2019, Ghana saw approximately 23,000 deaths from malaria, 14,000 from HIV AIDS, and 10,000 from tuberculosis. Alarmingly, air pollution caused even more fatalities with at least 28,000 deaths that year. Air pollution has become a major concern in Accra. With high levels of particulate matter, people breathe these things in and it affects their lungs and how the lungs perform. Factories and waste burning are to blame for a lot of pollutants, but transport, especially the old fleet of trotters, is the biggest single contributor. For those navigating this daily ordeal, the respiratory strain is palpable with each breath laden with potential health risk. Ayewaso West Municipal Health Director, Dr. Louisa Ademki Mate explains. Cataracts, eye problems, can be affected by these indoor air pollutants. Uh, for the past three years, in most districts, you will see that uh, respiratory tract infections are high on there. Dr. Ademki says, vulnerable groups tend to suffer the most. If you are having challenges with resources and you are getting sick because of your practices, it's just a vicious cycle. Because you don't have the money, now you are getting sicker. It just perpetuates the poverty. Despite the severe impact of air pollution on public health, there remains insufficient local research to establish a direct link between pollution levels and health outcomes. Desmond Apia, Country lead of Clean Air Fund says there's an urgent need for a more comprehensive research to better understand and address the health impact of air pollution in the country. The outdoor or ambient air quality is getting worse. And so it means something is still not clicking, something is still amiss. The only bad part or sad part is that there's not a lot of localized research. And that's what we are trying to change in our system. The city of Accra has now joined the Bridge Cities Initiative. It is a first-of-its-kind initiative from Clean Air Fund, C40 Cities, and Bloomberg Philanthropies to clean our air, cut carbon emissions, and enhance public health in cities around the world. And we hope by the end of the process of the Bridge Accra, we would have been able to reduce the pollution levels by a good 30 or so percent, because at the rate that it is going, it is not healthy for any of us. A network of 60 low-cost sensors and reference grid monitors have been installed across the city to provide real-time air pollution levels. Adentan is home to some of these sensors. The early data is already making a difference, 
offering a glimpse of hope in the fight against air pollution. Overseeing these effects is Andrew Ni Apai Abohe, the Municipal Environmental Health Officer. We were seeing high levels quickly. He told us that something was wrong. Quickly we deployed people. They realized that there were issues. One had to do with some burning that was taking place. So quickly action was taken. Jacob Johnson Atakpa, project coordinator of the Green Africa Youth Organization, Gayo, says they are also making progress with support from Clean Air Fund. And ensuring that we're able to, one, compost the organic waste that we have, convert the hard to degrade organic waste into um, briquettes for clean cooking, and as well as recycling all the recyclables that are in the system to ensure resource efficiency and sustainable production and consumption. According to the WHO, meeting the air quality guidelines of 10 micrograms per meter cube for PM2.5 could prevent more than 1,000 deaths annually in Greater Accra. For Joy News, Michael Ashale. Reducing air pollution by 30% by 2030, that's an ambitious goal. We want to find out how they plan to achieve this. Joining us in the studio now is Florence Kukui. She is Director of Public Health at the Accra Metropolitan Assembly. Thank you for your time here on News 6. First of all, let's start with the hot spots. Which areas have you identified so far to have most pollution? Okay, so good morning. And let me send warm greetings to my... Lady Mayor of Accra Metropolitan Assembly. Mm -hmm. So Accra Metropolitan Assembly, we have identified about eight hotspot areas. Mm -hmm. And this was done through the help of the Brit Accra project, which is funded by the Clean Air. Mm -hmm. So in the Greater Accra Municipal Assembly, we are, there are 13 MMAs that are benefiting from the Brit Accra project. Mm -hmm. And Accra Metropolitan Assembly happens to be one. So with the aid of the air notes and air sensors that the project gave to the assembly that has been mounted at uh, vantage areas and per the reasons, they have helped us to identify these hotspot areas. Mm. And we have Choco as one of the hotspot area. We have uh, Mamprobi as one of the hotspot area. We have Kolegono as one of the hotspot area. We have Tudu. We have cable and wireless. We have Agobluishi, mm -hmm. yes, and then we have a Zoti around the Kolebu enclave mm -hmm. as the hotspot areas, and there are different, 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 different anthropogenic activities at these areas that is leading to being the hotspot. Enlighten us, what activities exactly? So, for instance, let's go to the Choco mm. and its environs. Mm. You will uh, come across series of. Uh, fishmongering activities at the area. Mm. And they use what we call the choco ovens. Mm. And these choco ovens uses, uh, they use firewood as their fuel wood in mongering the fish. And they produce a lot of smoke. Yes, so through the production of the smoke, it leads to air pollution. Yes, and they do this in the environment. So mostly I say whatever we do to the environment is what we get as human beings or the animals that live in the environment. The environment as we have is the reservoir. And whatever you happen, whatever you, how you handle the reservoir will depend whatever will come out from the reservoir. If you handle the reservoir rightly, you will get good things coming out from it. If you don't handle it properly, you get bad things coming out from it. And the replication is what? Diseases. Mm. The replication is what? Death. The replication is what? Loss of economic uh, 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 availability or uh, impact. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, studies have made us to know that um, about 28,000 plus people die annually in Ghana through some form of air pollution activities. And economically, Ghana loses $1.6 to handling issues of air pollution. Mm -hmm. So if we educate the women at uh, uh, Choco who are using these Choco ovens mm -hmm. to uh, metamorphose from using the Choco ovens, and maybe come to the Ahunto oven. Mm. But human beings doesn't want change. The Ahunto oven has been introduced to them. That will reduce the emission of what? Smoke. Even the smoke as they themselves inhale has a negative impact on them. It can lead to what? Pulmonary or cardiovascular diseases. 
and all that, even pregnant women in the area, it will have impact on the unborn children and all that. Mm. So coming back to uh, cable and wireless, we are talking of circular economy, but how do we do it? Do we do it sustainably? At cable and wireless, you see they are doing recycling, plastic recycling, mm. but it is done in the open. They burn this, this plastic, they heat it in the open and they smoke everything all over. Some don't even put on protective clothes when doing all these things. And these are some of the anthropogenic activities that we do. Mm -hmm. Now let's go to the uh, Zoti around the Colombian cliff. There is uh, this uh, 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 old waste dumping site there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you go there and they are burning at the dumping site. And it's so close to so Colibu Teaching, close to Hospital. Colibu Teaching Hospital. And the people are breathing on healthy air mm. because we know that uh, uh, polluted air is any air that is contaminated by anthropogenic activities or natural disaster. And that have a harm on human beings, animals, or the environment. Mm. Yes. But we have a bigger problem in our hands because it's one thing to tell people to stop and sensitize them, but it's another thing to enforce it. You have an ambitious plan of reducing air pollution by 30%, at least by 2030. How do you then plan to enforce some of these regulations to ensure you reduce pollution? Thank you. I can rightly tell you that for the help of the Brit Accra project with the air sensors that we have, uh, dotted around the metropolis. Mm. It has helped us. I can be in the office and then go to the app, read it, and see which area of the hospital, which area is more polluted at what point in time, because it is a live reading. Mm. And when I come across a place that the readings is so higher, because according to uh, 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 Ghana Health, uh, Ghana, let me say Ghana Health Service or Accra standard levels of air pollution, mm. we the the PM 2.5 is supposed to be 30 microgram per meter cube. Okay. And then the PM 10 is supposed to be 70 microgram per meter cube. It's quite technical, but yes, for quite some of our audience, yes. you can break uh -huh. it down for us. So as and when, that is the, 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 the level at which mm. you can see that cannot be seen. Mm. Because when you talk of the, the, the 2.5, it is like, a thin hair that you can see. So when it's the, 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 that, that kind of pollution enters you, the, your nostrils, the, the, the hairies that are in your nostril cannot see to hold it. It will go straight into your system. Mm. Uh -huh. So now, through that, formerly we used to even read about 140, 200. But through mm. the education mm. and sensitization mm. that we are giving to the public, we have seen that now mm. things are changing. So this week mm -hmm. is uh, the air pollution awareness week that we term the blue skies mm. week. All over in all the 13 MMAs, you be the chef coordinators, the health promotion officers, the environmental officers, we are all together and we are moving from house to house, from uh, community to community, from market to market, educating the people on the impact of air pollution on their health. We are doing that because it is the activities that we do Mm. that reverse back to us. So we want to let our audience understand some of the things we're discussing here and it will be coming up on your screen shortly. Some of the hot spots in the greater Accra region where we have air pollution at higher rates. We will be showing you how this sensor works and thankfully Florence is here to break it all down for us and that will be coming up on your screen shortly. So I can see we have this on our screens. Florence, can you walk us through it? This is Kanishi Market. Yes, I can walk you through it. So as at now, you can see we have green. Mm. And the green there, it means if the, 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 thing is, the, the hand is lying on the green, it means the air that is around that area is very safe. It's okay. very clean. It has nothing to do with health. Okay. Then we move to yellow as throughout. So each level has what it is. Now it is unhealthy. It is around 100 plus. That is 151. So if I am at yes. Kanishi Market as we speak, it, I am inhaling um, unhealthy yes. air that is actually going to harm me. Yes. So in Kanishi Market, it will be good for you if you have, a, what will I say, if you, you, you put on max. Mm. Yes. So max, we are now bringing in back the wearing of the max in, 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 in the system. Mm. Because people think that after COVID, nobody should wear masks. Mm. But the 
pollution that we are inhaling in the system is so something. Mm. So this is unhealthy. So if you if you have uh, what would I say uh, 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 asthma, and then you inhale this thing throughout the whole day, you are likely to aggravate an action or uh, 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 cramps in you. Mm. So in town at a, a Kaneshi market, mm -hmm. you should be wearing what we call a, 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 a mask. I so can now see you see the PM. So now you see the PM, PM one. Yes. What you were talking about uh -huh. earlier. I was talking what about that earlier. Actually so mean? now it means so through the education, it mm. has now reduced. So when you see, though the 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 the, the overall air uh, uh, quality is. 50, uh, 151, mm -hmm. when you break them into the variables, the PM1, which is 54. Which that, is the one you can inhale. Yes. And then the hair in your nostrils can, cannot, protect, cannot you protect you from whatever yes. particle, particle is in the is air. In there. And that's 54. Yes. What does the 54 mean? So it means so it, uh, uh, the level is supposed to be 10. Okay. That level is supposed to be 10. And it's 54. And it is 54. And then the PM 2.5, the level is supposed to be 30, and it is 56. So it is the PM 10 that is within because it's supposed to be 70. Mm. Uh -huh. So explain the PM 2.5 and PM 10. What exactly so does that mean? So the PM 10 is like a, 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 for that one, a, when it goes, you see, every human being has some hair in your nostril. Mm -hmm. So with the PM10, mm -hmm. when the, uh, the, 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 the size of the, the pollution that is as par with the PM10 through, that is the microgram, microgram per meter cube, mm -hmm. entering your nostril, your, the, the hair in your nostrils can withhold it. Okay. Then it will sieve it mm -hmm. for you to breathe in uh, good air. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, let's look at the next slide because this is quite worrying. So if you are anywhere around Carnation Market, you should buy a nose mask because you are inhaling polluted air. Uh, this, this is, is Makola. Makola. So you can see Makola is a little bit better. Mm. But it comes with uh, sometimes is the timing, the timing, mm. what is happening at the area at a, time, a, a particular point in time. Mm. Sometimes, let's say uh, Carnation Market, this is the hay time, a lot of vehicular movements are going on mm. and emitting a lot of emission and all that on the environment. And this is what is happening. So depending on what activity is going on at a particular point in time, that will reflect on the readings of the, uh, 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 the air. Mm. I can see that even at Makola, yes. the current air, anyone around Makola would yes. be inhaling as we speak. Yes. It's so unhealthy for sensitive, sensitive groups. Yes, groups. Interesting. Yes. Let's look at our next slide. <laughs> and this is a bigger problem. It shows that we're actually neglecting something as sensitive as yes. air pollution, but it's impacting our health in ways we cannot even imagine. Now let's look at the agroglossy. So this is agroglossy. Mm. So you see all my agroglossy. So uh, after the series of education, the series of activities that uh, 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 we are doing and we are working with the scrap dealers, they have stopped burning the scraps. Mm. Now they go to collect the scrap. There is an in entity that uh, will receive the raw scraps. Then they will take it through processing than burning it. So formerly they used to burn a lot and that place was very bad. But through the education, all other things. In fact, the Bridge Accra project has come to help a lot. And I think if it, a lot of programs should come to augment it so that when the time is due and that project is out, another one should roll on. So that we at least we can also meet the Ghana standard of 10, 30, and 70 mm. of the PM levels. I'm quite concerned about the readings. And if you're just watching us, these are current readings as at 9 a.m. when we got the reading from Abu Brushi. And the air there is unhealthy. Florence, walk us through some of the other things we are seeing. We can see nitrogen dioxide 10. What does that mean? So, uh, so all these things are gases that are found in the air. Mm. You know, the air is made up of gases and other uh, 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 things that form out there. So mm. nitrogen is a type of gases that are found that may not be good for our health. And that's yes. at 10. Yes. 
Okay, but what's the standard number that ought to so be there? So the standard number for this is supposed to be five. Wow. <laughs> so that's like a 100% increase. Yes. So we are having a serious issue in the country, and I think through education, enforcement, so in Accra Metropolitan Assembly, we used not to have a, 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 in our bylaw maybe a direct law that is enforcing people who are doing things that can alter the air. Now we are reviewing our bylaws, mm. and most other people are reviewing their bylaws. Even with GIZ, they have come out with what we call the e a, a, a waste bylaw. Mm. And with these things, laws have been promulgated that we are going to add them on our bylaws and enforcement are going to be stringent mm. to ensure that people do the right thing. Because we are not going to allow people uh, 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 to make their profit at the expense of our health. What sort of punishment are you recommending in this bylaw? So, for instance, you can easily be sent to court mm. and you will be fined. Mm. You can easily be sent to prison depending on the, uh, the magnitude of the, the offense mm -hmm. that you have sent. You can also do what we call the cost of abatement. You can also pay cost of abatement to the assembly. And I think these days, things are hard. How many times will you continue to pay? So people who want to change, we are doing the education. So when we start with serious enforcement, nobody is going to say, I'm not aware. Mm. We are doing community debates. We are doing one-on-one -on -one education. We are, what we are doing now is a form of education. And a lot of, we are reaching out to a lot of people. So we are trying to encourage with our media friends that at least once a while, they can give us some airtime just like you are doing. Mm. So that we can come in, educate the people on what is happening in the environment. Mm. Yes. Enforcement would start when exactly? Pardon? When should we expect that you should start enforcing some of these proposals that you've been making into the bylaws? You know, education goes along with enforcement. Mm. As we are going around making the education. Mm. But when we even get to a point where like what you are doing is more than the education, we give you what we call an abatement notice. Mm. To abate whatever nuisances or offense that you are doing that can have an impact on the health of the people through a, a harming or through polluting the air. Then when an abatement notice is given to you, Number of days are, days are being specified on the uh, uh, abatement notice. Mm. So we, officers will come back for re-inspection. Mm. If the abatement notice is not complied with, then we apply for summons and send you to court. Mm. Yes, because we are measured by compliance. We are not measured by the number of people we send to court. When you are working with pay our work, the, the reduction of compliance rates means the people are understanding what we are saying and mm. they are abiding by it. But when there's an increase in uh, uh, prosecutions, it means the people are not taking what we want them to do. So we do a lot of education than enforcement. Mm. Thank you so much, Florence, for Thank joining you. us here. And we're looking forward to enforcement because that appears to be the only language that we understand. You're still watching Newsdex. Let's take you now to the Wa East District of the Upper West Region where residents of Jayiri there are asking government to fix bad roads in the enclave. They say their roads have been deplorable for almost a decade after they were washed away by floods. Farmers there are unable to cut their products to the market, leading to post-harvest losses as a result. There's more in this report by Rafik Salah. It is a death trap that has succeeded in claiming several lives and maimed dozens. The Bulunga Jayiri Road for 12 years has been in this deplorable state giving nightmares to commuters. It was a major headache for people living in the southwestern part of the enclave as they have always been cut off from having access to the district capital anytime there's a heavy downpour. Unit Committee Chairman of Jayiri, Ibrahim Yusuf, preferred for the construction of another bridge to add up to the old one to fix the challenge. Since 2012, when it first cut off, uh, our current uh, MP, who is a daughter of a city, he has come to our aid. If you could see, there's, there are certain uh, stones here. He came here with a tractor, I mean, to fill the, I mean, to fill, uh, the, the gap, which couldn't help. It, it, it has filled, and then uh, in, a, in a short period of time, we realized that w the water came and washed it away. So, and then, uh, what well, that was last year too, the DC also tried 
if you could see this uh, gravel here, he tried bringing some kind of educator to, to fill it. But when he filled it, it will wash up. And then looking at it, as I see today that we need another another bridge, not just to come and fill it and go. And then I'm I'm I'm, I'm just uh, I'm, I'm, I'm we are calling for a government intervention to come and help us. I mean to bring, to give us another bridge, not just to come and fill it and go. Government attempt to fix the road has been wishy washy in paying lip service to the plight of the people, leaving them to wallow in frustration, regret, and pain. The latest person to suffer the brunt of the bad road was a former assembly member of the Bulung electoral area, Said Mohamed Sani, was returning from Jairi when his black Tacoma pickup got stuck at the bypass. Whilst at Jairi going around looking for a tractor, I saw my son running towards me. I was even annoyed with him. I said, ah, I have asked you to wait so that in no vehicle or motorbike will crash our vehicle and you are running back to the community. It was then he told me that rain. I said, rain what? He said, water. I said, water what? That water has come to carry away the vehicle. I said, ah, this is unbelievable. So we all ran down to the valley. Unfortunately, the vehicle was nowhere to be found. The people have one plea that they want them to come to their aid. But I think the DC and then MP, they should come to our aid and then help us. If, if not this year, but at least when they win power, they should come to our aid and then help us. And we are now on the back end of a pickup so that we'll be able to move from one end of the road to the other. They are appealing to the government to come to their aid. Reporting for Joy News, Rafik Salam, Jayiri. Time now to do sports. Later today, the senior national team, the Black Stars, will take on Palancras Negras of Angola in a World Cup qualifier at the Babayara Sports Stadium. Now, let's engage Joy Sports Mubarak Haranam on the chances of the Black Stars. Thank you for your time here on Newsdex. Let's start with the team we have selected and who are we putting forward in terms of our defense and also our striking? Actually, this is... Uh a qualifier for the 2025 Africa Cup of Nations. Mm. And uh, it's a big one for the Black Stars. So Tuado has named 24 players mm. for that crucial encounter later today at 4 p.m. in Kumasi at the Baba Yara Sports Stadium. Now, out of the 24 players, um, two, one is doubtful, that is Elisha, uh, also a midfielder for the Black Stars. But the rest of the 23 players are fit. I'm sure you know about Jordan Ayu, Mohamed Kudus, Majid Jordan Ashimeru. is who I'm looking forward to. Yes, uh, in, in the last game for the Black Stars, he scored three goals. So yeah. clearly, he's in good form for the Black Stars. So 23 players are fit and ready to face Angola later today. Who are some of the players you are expecting on the field and what are their chances in terms of their performance strengths? Well, Otuado likes to keep his cards close to his chest in terms of his, <laughs> his first 11. So it's really hard mm. to tell the kind of players he would parade for today's game. Mm. But uh, I expect Lawrence Atizigi to be in post, obviously. He's been uh, the goalkeeper Otuado has selected in the last few games. You can talk about Tariq Lamte at right back. I don't know who would play at left back because Barbara Aman is not in the team. Mm. Gideon Mensa is injured. He hasn't been called. So... And then Mohamed Salisu at the centre half position. I don't know who he's going to pair with. Maybe Moomin in midfield. We have Majid Ashimero. We have Arsenal's Thomas Partey in attack. I've mentioned Jordan Ayu. Mm -hmm. I've mentioned Kudus. We have mm -hmm. Fatawi Sahaku, Joseph Pinsel, and then Inaki Williams. So uh, the players are there. I just don't know the the eleven players who will start for tonight's game. But I think. We have good players who can make a difference today. Let's look at our opponent, Angola. Mm. What are some of the things we should be concerned about when it comes to their formation? And you've watched them play before. Angola, look, they have improved in recent years. Mm. There's no doubt about that. In their last 15 matches, they won nine of them. They drew four and then they lost just two. Uh, it clearly tells you that they are on an upsurge, okay, in form. They have one manager who has been with the team since 2015. So he's been able to build a very, very formidable team to face the Black Stars today. And you look at the, the key players they have. Recently, they won the Kosafa Cup. They, 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 they beat almost, they won their last four games mm. to win that particular tournament. And the key players for Angola, you can look at the likes of Jelsin Dalla, who was instrumental 
in the team qualifying for the quarterfinals of the AFCON. The last AFCON, you remember Ghana's position, we mm. exited the group mm. stages. Mm. But for Angola, they qualified to the quarterfinals of the competition for the first time in about 14 years. So clearly they are performing. Justin Dalla is there. They have a striker called Depo. He in the Kosafa Cup. He has scored five goals in the Kosafa Cup. They have another striker called Mabululu as well. Mm. Such a dangerous striker. In, his, in the Egyptian league, he scored 16 goals. For Angola at the last AFCON, he scored three goals. So clearly they have chief tormentors that we have to be wary of. And the Black Stars have a problem mm. in defense as well. It's something that Otoado must... Uh, tighten up. If mm. not, we would be in trouble because the Black Stars in the last AFCON we considered mm. six goals in just three games. And even if you look at the goals the Black Stars considered in their la in their la in their last uh, international assignments, that was against Mali and Central African Republic, the Black Stars considered four goals, mm. which is not good. So it's something that Otuado must fix before the game today. What are your predictions? I'm looking at we win in hands now. Is it possible? Well. Uh, winning hands down, I think we are being overly confident. I mean, let's face the reality. Angola mm. are a very good side, mm. but they've got vulnerability as well. They also have a, a defensive issue. They've conceded 10 goals in their last 15 matches. So it's something that we can probably exploit, but the game will not be easy at all. I think the Black Stars will win narrowly, so it could be 1-0 one or 2-1. But we can't be overly confident because Angola are a very good side. And this game is for the AFCON it's for the AFCON, qualifiers. Yes. We're looking forward to that. We're bringing you um, live, live commentary, commentary yes, on Joy 99.7 FM. Time? We build up starting at 3 and the game kicking off at 4 p.m. Great. So we'll be looking forward to that. Let's do some other stories here on Newsdex. And we talk about our disabled series. He lost his sight right after sitting for the basic education certificate examination. Um, facing challenges and despair. But Robert Amponsan's determination to continue his education never we've waved. And the 20-year-old is pursuing his academic dreams with renewed hope. Emmanuel Jivenu has been engaging him in a disabled series. Let's listen. An English lesson. We are going to look at one of our selected poems. It's a regular class and these students are prepping for their end of term examinations. In here, visually impaired students study together with their sighted colleagues in an inclusive environment. All the meanness and agony without end, comma. Robert Amponsa was not born blind. I For 20 years, he has seen the beauty of the world and made a lot of memories with friends and family memories he will relish for life unfortunately his sight failed him just after sitting for the basic education certificate examination bc actually in 2020 in, in the month of september after my bc i decided to go to Thelma and work in one of the company. Across the line, I've been ha experiencing some severe headaches. So I don't think it's as serious. I just take it as a normal headache. And unfortunately, the eye is going small, small. So I decided to visit a hospital and they told me that uh, it's glaucoma. So gradually, gradually, no matter what I'll do, it will go off. Robert's blindness was sudden and unexpected. It left the young man constantly in tears, and the thoughts of having his eyes shut forever haunted him. At the ending of December, and both of the eyes went off. I have not been in this situation before, so when this happened, I decided to uh, kill myself, but uh, with the advice of my brothers and sisters, I did not do that. And it pains me a lot because I was not born with it and across the line, it happens like this. Robert had high hopes of seeing himself through senior high school, but his current condition has put a heavy burden on him. After the BEC, during the school selection, I'm even confused. It is by God's grace because uh, the, the schools that I chose, 
yeah, I just chose it like that because uh, after the BC, I was tired and stressful. So the pressure on us to choose the school, and I just selected the schools like that. So Mikra, that they don't matter I have crampo. I mean, it is it, a wonderful year. It's a miracle in my life. Yeah. His blindness at first made him question the essence of life and why he would continue going to school. But when Robert heard that Adidome SHS enrolled students with visual impairment, he had renewed energy to chase his dreams. I want to be a teacher so that I should be able to educate people how to cooperate with the visual impaired or how to manage with people how to manage people with disabilities <coughs> yeah at times peoples in our various community don't know how to manage their vis and moreover we have more opportunities for the vi but because of uh, 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 because people don't know they just leave them like that in the community. As to some other stories now, the United Nations Agency focus on tourism says despite the growth in tourism across Africa, connectivity, the ease with which people can travel between locations remains a challenge. Speaking at the opening ceremony of the seventh edition of the 2024 Africa Leadership Tourism Forum, the UN Tourism Regional Director for Africa, um, Grand Court, said her organization is working with all stakeholders to simplify visa entry requirements for travel within Africa and leverage innovative systems to digitize visa procurement. There's more in this report. Hundreds of people from the tourism um, industry all across Africa have gathered here in the capital of Botswana, Gaborone, um, to take part in the African Leadership Tourism um, Forum, all with one common aim and objective, to promote the Destination Africa agenda. The Africa Tourism Leadership Forum, ALTF, is the only Pan-African dialogue platform that brings together key public and private sector leaders and other stakeholders from across Africa and the rest of the world's travel, tourism, hospitality and aviation sectors to share insights, devise strategies for intra-Africa and tourism growth and network while enhancing the brand equity of Destination Africa. Speaking at a press briefing, Chief Executive Officer of Africa Tourism Partners, the organizers of the event, Kwachi Donko, urged various African tourism boards to decentralize the operations within Africa. What are we doing? So the tourism boards, unfortunately, they are not in the room, also need to change the mindset around it. And a lot of them, you see, they have offices in Germany, they have offices in Europe, and you we'll, have offices in Ghana. What are we doing in Ghana? They don't have an office in Ghana but they are able to pay lawyers and pounds. And if you see the arrivals that come there and work in the economy, sometimes it doesn't make sense. So there is a lot more than what meets the eye. And I think there is a lot of, and that is why we do what we do. And that's why we have ATLF to have opportunity to talk about these things. Mm -hmm. I hope that responds to the questions. Mm -hmm. okay. On the first day, there were masterclass sessions, business to business sessions, and many other activities carefully designed to enhance participants' knowledge and equip them with the tools to transform their countries into tourism hubs in Africa. Director of Trade in Services, Investment, IPR, and Digital Trade at the African Continental Free Trade Area, Emily Imburu Indoria, stated that the African Union is working to implement the Yamusukro decision which will improve air transport links, enabling faster and more efficient movement of goods and people across the continent, thereby supporting trade and tourism. And in this case, the air transport. And here, the AU, the African Union, actually does have a program of, uh, to have the single 
African air transport market. And under that program, there is actually a secretariat that is working towards ensuring that we implement what we call the Yamasukro Agreement, where countries have agreed to liberalize even their traffic rights in such a way that you can actually be able to have more transport or more connectivities and picking within countries. And an example can be the way uh, to uh, the Kenya Airways to West Africa. Uh, there is a flight that goes through uh, uh, Ghana, so they can pick uh, uh, passengers in Accra and then take the uh, passengers to Monrovia or to Dakar in Senegal and then pick other passengers there, drop them in, um, uh, in Accra on the way back to Nairobi. So those are just the different agreements that are covered in terms of ensuring that we allow for more traffic um, movement in the, in the continent. In December, people from the diaspora in other parts of the world flock to Ghana to experience the festivities, celebrations and cultural events that bring the country to life. The Beyond the Return initiative, particularly Dirty December, has prominently placed Ghana on the African destination map. As Ghana prepares for the December election, some may wonder how the celebrations will unfold. Deputy Tourism Minister Marco Krikumante is urging political parties to avoid statements that could heighten the country's political tensions and potentially discourage visitors. He made these remarks on the sidelines of the event. Yes, um, in the next few months we are going for elections, which will somehow uh, fuse itself with what people will come in for in December. Uh, it is up to us as a country not to create tension, not to say things that put people off, not to create an environment that comes across as toxic so that it does not affect people who want to visit. And so it is up to us as a people how we decide to go around it. We, 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 we are known for peaceful elections over the years. I, I'm, I'm not thinking that this will be exceptional. We are going to do what we know how to do best in December. We are peaceful people, we hand over beautifully, we believe in democracy, and we're going to do it again. And so if we, we the leaders, uh, Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, uh, John, the ex-president John Ramani Mahama, they decide, and the other people who are also coming on board. Uh, I'm mentioning these two because we know the competition is between the two. Mm -hmm. And so if they decide to, to, to call for peace, they decide to go decorous, decorum with the whole thing that we are going to do. I'm sure that the one who is coming to party in December, it doesn't really care who the president is. His interest or her interest will be a peaceful Ghana that you can have your fun in December as usual. You're watching John Newsdesk. We'll be back with business news. Please stay tuned. Hi, good morning. Welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Chief Executive of Ghana Gas, Dr. Ben Asante, has raised concerns about persistent revenue collection inefficiencies that are hindering growth in the gas sector. Speaking at the 2024 Roundtable in Accra, Dr. Asante called for urgent reforms to address these challenges which continue to undermine the sector's financial stability. The 2024 Roundtable discussion was held under the theme Building an Effective Gas Sector Revenue Management System, the Role of Stakeholders, according to the CEO of Ghana Gas, Dr. Ben Asante. Inefficiencies in revenue collection remain a significant challenge facing the sector. There is an insufficient collection at the tail end of the value chain. When you look at the power value chain, so those who provide fuel, for instance, fuel suppliers, and those who generate power, and then the transmitters of the power, and the distributors of the power, and certainly the end users of the power. So when you look at each of these gates along the value chain, we needed to address any inefficiencies that are there to help us do more of the collection or to balance the perceived imbalance between our revenues and our cost. 
Deputy Minister of Energy John Sani highlighted the positive impact of the cash waterfall mechanism on the gas sector. The cash waterfall mechanism and the natural gas clearing house to ensure equitable revenue flow to the service providers within the energy space. Whereas this mechanism have provided some recognizable relief to the sector. It is quite obvious that much more ought to be done to ensure their effectiveness. Minister for Public Enterprises Joseph Kujo stressed the importance of privatizing the ECG to enhance operational efficiency. Why are we afraid of the word private, private, private? But let me draw our attention to private schools. They run, right? And you will be surprised how ready and willing people with the ability to pay would send their kids to private schools and pay readily, willingly. Nobody forces them. But because we recognize quality service, that quality service must be paid for. But when it comes to a critical service like electricity, that we don't want to subject ourselves to right payment that would enable ECG also invest in it. If we don't do that, the alternative, and the alternative is that then government should consider Next, the Ghana Civil Society cocoa platform is uh, predicting that the country will record its lowest cocoa output in over two decades in the upcoming cocoa season. This, according to the group, is partly due to illegal mining activities and overall impact of climate change on the sector. Here's more in this report. Global cocoa production has been on the decline in recent years, partly due to climate change and disease. In Ghana, the situation is no different with the Ghana Civil Society cocoa platform predicting the country's lowest cocoa output in over two decades for the upcoming season. Speaking at a press conference in Accra, the group forecasted production to be slightly above 500,000 metric tons, a level comparable only to the 2002 and 2003 cocoa season. Francis Terno, a member of the group and president of the Macron Cocoa Farmers Association, highlighted illegal mining activities as one of the challenges contributing to vest decline. Ghana is said to experience its lowest cocoa output in over two decades, with production expected to be slightly about 500,000 metric tons. Comparably only to the 2002-2003 cocoa season. The 2023-2024 cocoa season was marked by significant challenges that affected and continue to affect farmers and the broader cocoa industry in Ghana. Illegal mining activities have severely damaged cocoa farmlands, threatening the lives and livelihoods of cocoa of farmers and dependents. Unfortunately, no clear pragmatic strategies have been proposed to tackle this problem, which threatens the very survival of the cocoa industry. With a higher expectations ahead of the new farm gate price announcement later this month, the group is also calling on authorities to support licensed local cocoa buying companies to prevent their collapse and keep them competitive with foreign companies. The problem we had last year uh, was that government couldn't get the syndication loan on time. So they, they asked the international companies to support in purchasing the cocoa. But those local, local companies like Fedco, uh, Cocoa Merchant, Abrabopa, and all those companies, they don't have any big brother anywhere. So all right, that's it for business. Back to you, Fosti. Thank you, Dara, for bringing us business. And that's it for Joe News X. For more news, please log on to my joeonline.com. My name is Faustina Safo. Up next is Joe News Today. And Switia Bochi will be back on your screens.